there obviously the Republicans come into power, um, Dole comes into power, and all of a sudden, I mean, I heard him talk about the difference between all of a sudden you have to be responsible. I mean, all of a sudden you have to right. govern. Right. And uh, and obviously the Finance Committee was the chief arena for him to test that theory. Did he, did you sense that? That shift. Well, I, I think it was something that uh, was building when he became uh, ranking on finance. And, and when was the, that? That was uh, in 1979. Uh, okay. So it was 79 and 80. Right. Uh, those two years he was ranking. And, and that coincided. I remember there was the Steiger uh, in 78. I mean, Republicans were beginning to be a party of intellectual ferment. And, and, and you know, in 1980, the uh, Finance Committee reported out, much to Carter's chagrin, a uh, tax cut bill with uh, a depreciation component. So it was like a 30% cut in rates and, and 10 5 3 depreciation. And Benson and Long supported it. Really? And Reagan actually endorsed it. Uh, with the Finance Committee bill that was produced by uh, Chairman Long and and what and was the, the administration's did they have a counter the, 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 they they just supposed they thought it was uh, you know wrong to spend that kind of money and so uh, that was the first order of business is to uh, produce the uh, tax cut bill which was a relative you know it was a good task to start it wasn't like it was easy because once you start cutting taxes everybody has got uh, an idea how so you have to try to keep it contained I assume it's safe to say that Bob Dole was not by instinct temperament outlook a uh, charter member of the supply cider well, no but I don't th I mean I think uh, uh, he uh, was completely dismissive either. I mean, he sort of, I, I remember during this period of time, and it must have been at, the, at this point where supply side economics was, uh, was all the rage, and there was some particular book that somebody had written on supply side economics that uh, Dole had like an appendix attack or some reason, kidney stones. Kidney stones. And he was up at Walter Reed, and I remember he he was really laid low by it. Uh, he called one time. He was out for a while. He called one time, and his voice was so weak, he didn't sound like himself. And then he, he was getting better, and so Bob Lighthizer and I went up there to see him. And the president actually had been up maybe an hour earlier and given him a copy of this book. I think it was Jude Winiski's book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Uh, so you know, uh, he he wasn't a uh, a uh, charter member, and he wasn't a uh, blind believer. But you know, he wasn't somebody that dumped on it either. I mean, I assume he is of the school of conservatives that believes that deficits not only matter economically, but that there's almost a moral component. Well, he, uh, you know, he had sort of sponsored the balanced budget amendment for such a long time, and I think just by disposition and background, he is uh, inherently conservative in a fiscal conservative sense of somebody that didn't have money, that money, you know, uh, you know, sort of depression era mentality that my parents have because my parents are two years older than uh, Senator Dole. Uh, so, you know, he wasn't a guy that uh, was a giveaway artist and cared about that and wanted to see uh, spending cuts, balancing tax increases, and loophole closers balancing tax increases. I mean, it really came to the fore in, in 82, after the big 81 tax cut, uh, and... Uh, we we launched that. Well, was, I assume eighty one was easier than eighty two. Yeah, eighty one. You're giving stuff away. Although we did cut spending, and that uh, there was an omnibus uh, budget reconciliation thing, and that that had so that may have been the beginning of the uh, 
Diagnostic Related Group or DRG system, which is uh, uh, an effort to sort of trim uh, spending on on healthcare by paying uh, a flat amount for or for a DRG and sort of organize the the billing of uh, of medical services. Um, were those were those spending cuts real cuts in, in the in the eighty one? Yeah, I think they, they they were they were real cuts. I mean, you know, changes in program that resulted in lower spending. And of course, Reagan had to sell that package over the heads of a Democratic majority of the House. And that was uh, that was the we had a relatively easier time of it in that uh, you know you had Long and Benson who had supported something similar to that and so we had some bipartisan uh, interest in this bill. On the uh, House side, uh, Rostenkowski was trying to uh, have a much more parsimonious bill and he was eventually rolled on the floor. Uh, and, and, and I remember that night very well because there was some kind of a party that we were invited to over at the Ways and Means Committee and we were working on wrapping up the uh, uh, conference on the reconciliation bill. And so we, we were over there working with the staff on, on that conference and then we went to the uh, the, this party, which immediately preceding, Ross and Kowski got rolled, so he he and the staff were in really foul humor, and it was, uh, I think it was uh, then Democratic Senator uh, Congressman uh, Graham. Uh, Phil Graham. Phil Graham. It was Graham Latta. Yes. Which was the sort of Republican-based substitute that came in very close to the Senate bill. And then we had to go to conference with Ross and Kowski, who had been rolled, and so he was going to conference on a bill that wasn't his. And so that was a little challenging. Tell, but me, tell me about the dual Ross and Kowski relationship. Well, you know, I think they uh, got along pretty well and knew how to uh, horse trade. They're sort of both pragmatists. And, and you know, one of the things that happened is that we met at a staff level and worked out, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the bill. How would that work? We would sit down with the Rosinkowski staff and, uh, and go th through it and figure out where there were either no disagreements on things or where there were uh, non-controversial trades that could be made. And so we scripted. We would take their books and script, uh, you know, they would concede to us, we would concede to them and sort of go through it. And so you could, it facilitated the uh, conference. And, and how often would you be, in effect, reporting back to or checking with Senator Dole? You know, uh, you know, we would go over there and go through a bunch of them, and then we'd go through uh, those with, uh, with him. And by and large, that worked pretty well. I remember there was one occasion where we were going to concede something, and, and Senator Chafee said, hey, hold on. And Ross and Kasky sort of looks over at us and says, well, what gives? And he's like, can't you control your people? <laughs> and of course, it wasn't always possible to do that, but it, it actually worked out reasonably well. I mean, we weren't taking on the things that, that people really cared about. And I, my recollection is that that bill we conferenced one night. We started about five o'clock in the evening, and we went all night. And uh, in the morning, we had an agreement, which was one of those tour de forces. We did it in S or HR, whatever it is. Yeah, it's a meeting with the committee members. Yeah, it was the, it was the conferees, all the conferees, and it was in a in one of those Capitol buildings that had a big long table, and there was sort of a little ante room, but there was there was room for two press people, and there was a woman named Franklin. I'm trying to remember what her first name was, but she was one of the two press people, and I remember at some point I watched her go like this and bang her head against the wall. And, she, and I thought, God, pay attention, your whole press is counting on you <laughs> reporting it. But they, they worked out a pretty fast accommodation, and we got that uh, bill passed. And what do you do, Walt, I mean, what... what um 
What well, you go through the bills that are different, and uh, you know there was. A, I remember I particularly worked on some package of energy. You know, small. You know, independent energy stuff, and sort of they didn't have any of that in there. And Ross McCaskey's skeptical, and so we worked through what was going to be in there. And uh, I guess, and what level of detail would Dole become involved? I mean, what he obviously. Uh, I mean, he actually has a he has an ability to. I mean, he would get into deep detail on big things that mattered. And, and as I say, you know, there half of these provisions are little provisions that that aren't controversial, don't involve much money, and he doesn't need to worry about those. So those would be worked out in advance. But if there were a big issue, he was able to uh, penetrate within that issue what the sub issues are and the sub sub issues, and 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 he is a very clever. Uh, Ability to sort of see where there might be a potential compromise, and not all. I mean, you'd sort of say, "What about this?" And you say, "Well, that's not going to work." Well, what about this? Yeah. So maybe that would work, and so, yeah. so we'd fashion something. But he he has. Uh, Is that the hard? It's funny because Senator Mitchell said, and "I said, tell me." Mitchell said he had this uncanny, um, instinctive ability to know what it would take to bring two people together, what it would take to to bring two positions together. Well, to it, 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 bill. it's not only anticipating that, but also thinking about different ways to approach it. You know, so there was some intellectual cleverness that was also at play. I think it's understanding where the other guy's coming from and where you're coming from and figuring out where, where there is a difference, but sort of tr trying to find trade-offs or, or something else out here that, that he might throw in that would interest people. But it really is a, it was a gift. Uh, of uh, obviously it requires some kind of psychological yeah. talent yeah. To, to be able to scope up people and know what we're doing. I think he listens carefully to what somebody's saying about their position. Yeah. And sort of thinking about, you know, that's their position, this is our position. How do we how do we bridge that? And so I, I think it is some appreciation for I, I mean I'm not sure that he would Necessarily, even be aware that he, he uh, was listening intently, or or had that innate ability. But it was something that was a, a remarkable ability to see the other side and see where there might be some middle ground. I mean, it's not flawless that it worked every time, and 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 he would often sort of throw out ideas, and you know, he might throw out three ideas that didn't work, mm. and then he would try the fourth. You saw, I mean... I saw the persistence is, is yeah. another... another. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see old-fashioned persuasion? I mean, where he sat down with yeah. someone and literally... Well, I mean, you know, and sort of said, gee, you know, this is bad policy, you know, and this, you know... I mean, he, he had... He had a... Uh, a desire to... Uh, to improve... The taxes, you know, just on taxes, uh, you know, sort of a uh, desire to make things fair, or better, simpler, and so good tax policy did mean something to him. I mean, it wasn't the be all and end all. You know, sometimes we did things that were jury built because that was where we found the uh, the middle ground. But if you, you know, if you had a uh, a choice where there would be abuse versus uh, uh, non-abuse. He'd take the non-abuse or, or correct an abuse or close a loophole. Because I think, you know, that he has has some populist sense about this that, uh, that he would bring to bear. And it's not like he was, uh, uh, this was a cause. I think it's intuitive in him that uh, the people ought not be uh, taken advantage. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, because, talk about taking abuse, because he was walking a tightrope, clearly. Um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, as I recall, the original wasn't a 30% tax cut over three right, years. Right, right. It become 25 over three yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and clearly there were folks, which personifies, but I mean, there were clearly the true believers mm -hmm. who looked at Noel and saw him as a, I mean, they thought he was bragging his heels and he mm -hmm. wasn't uh, sufficiently, um, you know, enthusiastic about the whole Reagan program. I mean, how did he sort of navigate those waters? And in particular, what was the relationship with the White House? Um, uh, I mean, presumably Jim Baker yeah. was... was uh, I mean, I think he had good relations with the White House, and we didn't have a problem, and Gingrich was always a kind of a backbencher that was popping off, but wasn't on the relevant committees. And... Uh, and ultimately was a non-factor because he was in the minority. So uh, it was more, Dole would listen to uh, Barbara Conable a lot more than he would listen to Newt Gingrich. Because Newt Gingrich was a young backbencher and, and uh, uh, but, but and Conable was, was for some yeah, yeah. significant body of... But not, uh, and, well, I would say an insignificant body in terms of the real politic of the House. Okay. Because the, you, you could, uh, if you could strike a deal with Ross and Kasky and some Republicans, you didn't need that body. Um, now, Conable, I think, was somebody who was more in age, closer to Dole, and, and in temperament, closer to Dole. Do you so. think that's important? I mean, do you think generational bonds are... Uh, yeah, I, I do. I do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think that, uh, that he would have rejected working with somebody who was younger, but I think uh, he had some natural affinity, I guess, as we all would. Yeah. Maybe if you're a young person, you have more affinity with another young person. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, um, but Stockman. Um, that must I, have been a I think he worked very well with Stockman, and Stockman uh, was a very bright, clever guy. Uh, you know, where I saw it best was uh, in 1985. Although uh, maybe in 83, putting together the Social Security package, which Stockman played a big role in. But in 1985, we fashioned this great big uh, spending cut package. And we, uh, Dole went back and had somebody count up. We had 43 official meetings of the members. And Stockman was generally there uh, to try to sort of massage uh, the spending cuts that we had. and. We were counting on and, and got virtually no Democratic vote, so we had to get the votes among our own people, which meant we had to just work and work and work, and anybody that had a wild hair about anything, we had to figure out how to deal with it, you know, accommodate it, you know, change the proposal, drop it out, whatever it is, uh, because you did, and so you had to just work and work and work that package. And that was the same thing that we did in 1982 with TEFRA. We had no Democratic Democrats uh, virtually helping us. Let me back up yeah. because I want I want to put the context. Uh, Eighty one. So you you, you pass this package. Tefra obviously well, recognizes or is predicated upon a belief that we went too far. Right. What did you believe at the time, Sub Rosa, um, that, that you were going too far? Well. Uh, on some provisions as they played out, yes, just as a matter of tax policy. Uh, as a matter of fiscal policy, it was pretty apparent. And the big driver of TEFRA, which was part of tax increases, spending cuts, was the fact that we had 18, 20% interest rates. And Paul Volcker met with the Finance Committee and Dole and said, if you do this package, I'll ease up on the money supply. And that's what was the real motivator. And he did. We passed it, and he did, and that broke the interest rate cycle. Do you have any idea, I mean, would that have been early 82? Or? Yeah, it was early 82 that they met with him, and, and Dole pursued that uh, 
and, and, and sold it to the White been, House and there had to have been a a forerunner to that meeting. I mean, was Dole already looking for... Yeah, I mean, you're looking at... Well, I mean, we're we come into the January time, you're looking at the budget, you record the budget deficits, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, record interest rates, the economy suffering as a result. Uh, so, you know, it was really Volcker's promise if we did that, he would he would uh, ease the money supply so interest rates would go down and that would help the economy. That was all a package and that was the motivator for um, I think all the members of the committee were believers that this is something that we should we should do. I, I don't remember, did that ever leak? Uh, I don't know whether it leaked, but uh, I mean, they talked about it a lot among themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, 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 obviously speculative. I, I guess I'm surprised to hear any Fed chairman make that flat a plan. Well, it was a remarkable statement and, and was highly motivating. I mean, that, I mean, this was, this was a hard bill to pass. It was a hard bill to put together. But they, people obviously believed Volcker when he said yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, something yeah. Yeah, he was, he was, he had great credibility uh, uh, in his day. Uh, and and he stuck to his word. The, the, you know, when I th sort of think about the abuses of the uh, 1981 bill, one particularly stands out, and it had revenue associated with it by shutting it down, but it was something called safe harbor leasing. And uh, uh, Senator Dole was sufficiently outraged by it that in February, I think, of 82, he put a press release sort of saying, I'm going to uh, repeal this for transactions after today. And what it's, was it? It, it, it was... Uh, an ability for for companies that uh, made large capital expenditures to basically sell those tax credits to companies that wanted to reduce their taxes. You know, you can if if you're an airline and you don't need the deduction of buying a lot of airplanes because that's a very capital intensive business, you don't buy the airplanes, you enter into a long term lease and somebody else is taking the, uh, the uh, tax deductions for those leased airplanes. And so you don't have those capital deductions on on the airlines part there's somebody else that, that well this was a way to sort of say hey, you don't have to bother to uh, lease anything we can just pretend you do and you can sell them and that resulted in sort of uh, sort of an unseemly uh, companies with a lot of tax liability just going buying tax credits uh, at a discount and so he announced this is stopping and the sort of the per he, he was troubled by the sort of the perception is that you just uh, that this was a, uh, a gimmicky loophole that will allow companies to zero out their taxes and so that day people all over America were flying and signing deals on airplane contracts because that was the last day because it's a after today it's dead now he wasn't able to keep the effective date I mean the, 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 in some ways you can sort of say that's an outrageously unfair thing because what power is he he's one member of the uh, can't change the law by fiat but says something about his credibility by that time yeah uh, and and we did repeal safe harbor leasing and we left some of the worst deals with that effective date but generally we moved the effective date back a bit uh, what else was in tougher i mean what how did it they kind of well, one of the, one of the things uh, was the uh, there's currently a huge effort to look at the tax gap right now and uh, all the uncollected taxes and, and I'm reading something it's sort of the last tax last time there was a big effort to, to go after the tax gap was in 1982 well that well that was we had a major project because the theory was if we have to raise taxes let's look at people who are not paying the taxes that are due now before we ask people to pay new taxes and so we were looking at uh, 
various ways to uh, to deal with uh, non-compliance with the tax laws and and uh, interest in dividend withholding was one of those ideas that and it passed in that bill another a controversial idea yeah yeah and then later got repealed the next year but uh, it was passed as part of this uh, uh, another another provision that was part of that package was uh, a provision that required reporting only, not withholding, but reporting on the amount of restaurant tips, and they would sort of allocate on of seven percent of the the uh, the gross tip sales by employees, and have information reporting on that, so that the IRS would know sort of the size of of what the likely tip income would be. Uh, and that was bitterly opposed by the restaurant owners. You know, it's how unfair. And uh, and they took it on on the Senate floor. And some Democrat moved to strike that provision. And it had been hotly lobbied by the restaurant industry. And uh, it was knocked out. And I remember hearing the sort of the cheers from the, the that place by the elevators where all the lobbyists were. And they went down to the monocle to celebrate. <laughs> And of course, that knocked a big hole in our bill, uh, that revenue. And so, you know what Dole's reaction? Dole, when uh, we went and had a uh, uh, meeting of the finance committee, Republican members in the cloakroom, and came up with a substitute for it, which was to disallow the deduction for half of business meals. We passed it that night, and I remember Dale. Bumpers, who uh, always used to rail against the three martini lunch, voted against it, and he was hissed by other members. You know, for, for being a being a hit, being being a big hypocrite uh, for voting against that, but it passed, and all of those restaurant people were shocked to the core. Were they still down at the monocle? They're down at the monocle. The next morning, they wake up and 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 literally within a couple of weeks a whole delegation of restaurant people, of the prominent restaurants in this city, every restaurant that I'd ever heard of, came in and asked us to reinstate the tip reporting and take out the half of business meal deduction, which we did in conference, but we took that 7% and made it 8%, a little, little tolling charge. And ironically, the half of business meals deduction was later enacted, so they got that too. <laughs> And, and, I, seem to be doing okay. and, and and I think that this has had some salutary impact on uh, on uh, the uh, compliance with uh, with the laws. I mean, you know, there were people that sort of waitresses sort of said, "Why are you picking on me?" You know. On the other hand, the uh, person that's working at McDonald's that gets no tips, they pay tax on 100% of their income because of the uh, withholding system. So at any rate, uh, that was a major component. And there were other sort of loophole closers and, and ways to... Uh, was this being developed with at least the tacit approval of the White House? We actually were, yeah. Uh, and we were working with the did, Treasury did Department. Did they deny a bill? I mean, what where was the and was there such a thing as the White House? Uh, you know, eh, you know because yeah, I mean, you, you know, Treasury is the is one part of the administration, and we work closely with the the people in tax policy on on that. Uh, you President Don Regan. You know, I thought he was uh, a talented, uh, you know, a bright guy, quite ill-suited for the Washington environment. He really didn't have the sort of the touch, never had the touch for the the way Washington worked. Was a, was a little, probably spent too much time as a CEO and used to dictating to people. And that doesn't kind of work, you know, as opposed to Jim Baker's very smooth touch. Um, but you know, he he was a a, a decent fellow and and uh, capable. Uh, you know, so I mean, I think he was you know better as a treasury secretary because uh, his ability to manage a department uh, yeah. was was his CEO experience was useful. 
and the political side was less important when he went over to the for the White House. He was quite ill suited for that job, so he, he should have been. And, and presumably, Treasury, he still had he he still had some credibility in the in the financial yeah. community. Yeah. You'd call. Right, but, and uh, and so uh, you know, I think he was uh, a uh, reasonably successful Treasury Secretary, even if he were a failure as White House Chief yeah, of Staff. Yeah. Did Dole, uh, I assume, in the White House was Jim Baker, the guy Dole worked. Yeah, for yeah. And and yes, and and Baker is uh, as good as they come, at least as good as I've seen. I mean, there are p people maybe as good, but. What made him so good? I mean, you know, he has. Uh, he's he's a uh, uh, enough of a substance guy and, and a very smooth political operative, uh, and has a very pleasant manner. Never was a CEO, I don't think. Yeah, so he's not the blustery uh, uh, CEO type. So, in vast experience in Washington, new people had good relations with people for long periods of time, whereas Reagan was coming in from the outside. During this period, I mean, was there any kind of direct contact with the president? Uh, or are you basically you're working through subordinates uh, as you develop? No, we had we had. Uh, I mean, he was down there for for meetings. Uh, you know, the where they bring the leadership in. Uh, you yeah. know, and the committee chairs. Uh, and you know, I, I can recall one meeting uh, uh, in '81 with all the oil people that. Uh, Dole arranged with the president. I can recall another occasion. I think in '82, uh, the Enterprise Zone piece was enacted, and it was something that was really important to the president. And I think it was '82. If it wasn't '82, it was uh, in in '84. But the president called him down there just to sort of say, I really want this in the bill. And interestingly, Dole did not believe in it himself. He didn't buy the Enterprise Zone thing. Why, why but, but, he, but he did it for the president. Did it have anything to do with the fact that it was especially Jack Kim? <laughs> no, I, you know, I don't know that it was uh, that, that small. I just don't think he thought that, you know, this economically isn't a good idea to sort of carve out his own. We're in his own right here. We get tax credit because we're in this zone and employ people here. It's worth about three or four thousand dollars to me every year <laughs> for that. Yeah. We were here before. Yeah. Employing the same people. Yeah. yeah. But so at any rate, uh, uh, what I remember, I remember going, I went with uh, Senator Dole down to meet with the president and the president really sort of said how much he wanted it. Uh, and I remember also getting it enacted on the floor and there were there was some effort to knock it out and he fought to keep it in yeah. you know and, and you know that this is just not his favorite thing and I remember getting in the uh, the old subway cars with him and he said well we got it enacted he said that's not just a dog, it's a kennel. <laughs> I always remember that. It's not a dog, it's a kennel. <laughs> what do you think the chemistry was between the two? Because, I mean, in some ways they're polar opposites in terms of their approach to this kind of mm -hmm. work. Whereas Dole um, almost raised to the level of principle his own shortcomings in terms of the kind of mass shaping of an issue and communication, mm -hmm. persuasion. On the other hand, you know, no one um, took more seriously um, the innards of, of the process and or worked harder at, right. at making the process work. Um, did, did they complement each other? Uh, did they understand yeah. each other? Well, one thing, uh, you know, uh, Dole as finance committee chair and as majority leader, was always very loyal to uh, the Republican presidents, and and did things that uh, that personally he wouldn't have cared to do, but did it. And, and uh, you know, I think he liked. Uh, and uh, liked Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan was a very likable guy and very persuasive. Uh, and even though you sort of think, God, the guy doesn't know 
you know, fully what he's talking about, but you couldn't help but like him. Uh, Famous Bob McFarlane line, which which I've always thought sums up better than anything else. McFarlane sort of scratches his head. He says he knows so little. And yet he accomplishes so much, and and, and it's remarkable. Uh, I mean, he's he's, uh, I think, in the analysis, going to be one of the great presidents, uh, and and to some extent because he he wasn't focused on the weeds. He he had some vision as to where he wanted to go, and he managed to get it there. Uh, the, the, it was reciprocated that that Reagan liked and appreciated. I think he did. Oh, yeah, I do. And then there may be the sort of age camaraderie, uh, admiration for Dole's service to the country, uh, you know, uh, yeah. and to the party over a long period of time. Uh, you know, they, they, they seem to do fine. But, you know, what's even more remarkable is uh, stop lying about my record, bitter primary. Dole goes back to the Senate having lost that and picking up and carrying out George Bush's agenda. That's even more remarkable and, and shows sort of his ability to sort of subjugate uh, sort of the feelings or whatever and... And, and, and remember, not only walk, not stop lying about my record, but before that, the, the, the very dramatic confrontation on the Senate floor where Adol confronted Bush in the vice president's chair. Remember, there have been those stories about Elizabeth's trust and all yeah. that stuff. And, yeah. And it was but, but, but the, you know, to me, that was remarkable. His, his ability to put that defeat behind him and go back to work, uh, you know, I think probably uh, was born out of that determination that caused him to lift that weight on the side of that that garage for so many reps that uh, that that he had the ability to just put it behind him and move on, which is remarkable. Tepper, I, I think it was Tepper, that, they had this melodramatic conclusion where Pete Wilson was brought in on the Senate floor, or was it another? I, mean, I don't remember whether that was Tefra. I, it might have been the 85 budget compromise oh, where okay. uh, I think that was it. Uh, where And gosh, it was like 2 in the morning that they brought him in and he'd had a Penix operation that day and the guy looked green. Um, I, I, one of the things that I remember, and I think it was 82, if it wasn't 82, it was 84, which was another budget bill called DEFRA. The TEFRA was the Tax, Equity, and Fiscal Responsibility Act, uh, <laughs> which, was, which was a name that, uh, that I actually invented. We had to name that bill contest, and that was my name, and, and Dole picked it, and so it's TEFRA. Do you remember any of the alternatives? I, I don't, but uh, somewhere, somewhere I have... Uh, <laughs> I have my handwriting of the, the list of, of my things and checked that one, which is the dull light. I had, I had a law partner uh, uh, and mentor, Eddie Cohen, who was Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy under Richard Nixon, uh, who came here out of Treasury and I started working for him before I went to work on the Hill. And Eddie, who was a great punster, sort of said, Rod, you've always pronounced that wrong. It's Tifra. So you can have Tifra too. <laughs> I think it's classic Eddie Cohen. He died uh, about a uh, year and a half ago at age 92 as he was walking down to get in his car at his house to go down to work out at the gym. So <laughs> one of the great tax minds. Uh, and wrote a big long book that was that thick after they edited it down about his life and all of the stuff that he did called Deep in the Heart of Taxes. <laughs> <laughs>
I think that that may be one of the uh, seminal events in, in restoring the economy of the United States. Uh, passing that, the bargain with Volcker, the uh, the cutting of interest rates, the uh, resumption of economic growth. And Volcker kept his word. Volcker kept his word. And to me, you know, I'm less concerned about, you know, gosh, you raise taxes here, you cut spending there, you know, did you get two for one and all of that. You know, my view is we saved the economy and that's what we were after. It wasn't. You know, and, and you know, whether all of the pieces were uh, Justifiable. I mean, the interest and dividend reporting was repealed the next year after a series. Uh, that was a bitter period uh, for me, yeah, because, uh, you know, uh, we had to face a series of bills where Caston uh, from Wisconsin would offer amendments to repeal it, and, and we were fighting to uh, keep it, and, you know, he. He wasn't happy about it, and, and uh, the, the irony was we, in conference, we gave uh, an additional six months before it became effective because the bankers came in and said, well, we need time to implement it. And Bob Lighthizer and I argued that that was a mistake. And Mark McConaughey sort of said, no, they really need it. And we said, Senator, don't do that. You know, they just give them time to organize and repeal. No, McConaughey, and so he decided, and, and Bob and I pushed it to the point of uh, just short of being insubordinate, uh, you know, you know, usually you take the boss's judgment and, and we thought this was a mistake. And, and, and how so... Let, how did he let you know that... I mean, you were pushing and he was pushing back. Yeah, sort of say, hey, I'm going to do that, you know, so, so, okay, he's going to do that. Well, then, when the bankers all organized this massive campaign and we got mailbags of postcards, uh, you know, repeal interest and dividend withholding. And, and at that point, Bob goes off to USTR. And, and, but, uh, you know, one of the reasons he has to face me every day, you know, fighting this, knowing that uh, we had pushed him hard on this, that this was this was a mistake and that this was going to come about. And I, you know, we worked really hard to try to come up with arguments for why it would, and, uh, and uh, we had statements. And I remember one Saturday, the whole staff was in there working on, on statements and preparing and getting analysis. And uh, the president's radio address was in support of this. And then they had a call-in program after that, that he could call in, and every you know, I said this is Rod from Virginia. I think withholding, and and this is Andre Leduc from D.C. So we all called in. We couldn't get those joint the joint committee people who are big weenies wouldn't call in. Uh, and then at the end of the hour, I said, "Well, it's." Uh, this is not an official poll, but uh, you know it's eight to five in favor of keeping withholding. But, you know, so that's how that's how far well we fought at uh, at the hedgerows. We fought and, and 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 it was fought out on the floor over two or three bills, so we were having to run to the floor. And I remember there was an article in the uh, Time magazine, maybe a cover story on on this and. Uh, and he wanted to talk about that, and so we had a copy of the the cover story and the article, and and we'd put together all of these statements on various aspects of it and charts, and 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 Don Suswine was sort of the leader of the staff, and he came running over with one of these great big fat briefcases full of statements or whatever, uh, and uh, Don said, "Where's the article?" and they gave him a photocopy, and it said, "No, I want." The, he wanted to have the the color version of the magazine. And he sort of said, uh, would you just bring yourselves? And, you know, we'd been working for a month, you know, around the clock and had a hundred statements in there. He said, what did you just bring yourself? That was the sort of the pressure. It was a very unpleasant experience to go through. Uh, uh, and we eventually lost that. Uh. And by the way, just to clear out, he typically would be in the office on Saturdays. Yes. And, and so were so, so we. I, I remember on one occasion, 
and it may have happened more than once that I brought my son with me who was a little toddler and, and he would play with little John Deere tractors and they uh, that were around the, the Kansas office mm -hmm. and I remember also discovering that leader didn't like little kids because he walked in the, the doll's office with me he's a little tyke at the time and, and the dog just went crazy barking at him and snarling at him I don't know who leader liked well I, I think the, the the suspicion was that leader maybe had been abused by children so he reacted that way to children yeah, which is quite possibly the case I, I, he never barked that way at me hmm. uh, it may be that because years later I uh, I sort of protected his manhood uh, because shortly after I arrived at the Labor Department, they had uh, bred leader to Strom Thurmond's female schnauzer and they produced a litter of puppies and it was in all the papers mm -hmm. about this mating and these these puppies in the uh, humane society from which that had uh, from which they had adopted the dog. Um, had an agreement that the dog was supposed to be spayed or neutered or whatever uh, and that was and whoever Elizabeth Elizabeth staff person went out and picked the dog up and signed this agreement yeah. not them and and I remember Elizabeth sort of said geez what should we do and and she came to me because I I actually uh, grew up around dogs uh, my parents raised show dogs and the show dog you would never neuter because you can't show them once you do that uh, they have to be fully intact but I sort of explained the procedure because I've had a lot of dogs spayed uh, and uh, uh, ultimately he didn't get spayed so. <laughs> but they uh, he he uh, always was uh, the most hard-working of uh, of anybody up there I mean his hobby I think was was doing more work and politics and uh, you? and you know on Sundays then he would go watch the talk shows if he wasn't on the talk shows and of course he was on the talk shows most of the time and and early on we used to Bob and I used to go over there and sit with him on Sunday mornings and go through Q and A's and whatever and, and sometimes go to the studio and, and I remember Elizabeth would sit with us and then she'd go to church did he go but, to church no, because he was going to, on the talk shows. <laughs> he went to another church. Yeah, he was going on the talk shows. And, and he was, by a, a significant margin, the uh, the top appearing person. You know, they do these sort of rack-ups. And, and, you know, when Frist was leader, McCain was way above Frist in terms of the number of appearances. Uh, but Dole was the champion of that, of that, and of course, I guess the more he did, the, the better he got at it, and the more they liked him. And he was always, always sort of made news and knew where to dribble out something. Well, you, it's funny you mentioned. Uh, 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 let's just take a pause for a moment because this was about the time when the whole power couple thing was was taking off, and so on, so on, and, and this this sort of I think popular notion took root. Um, you know always looking for the obvious um, and assuming that well gee Bob Dole is different this is a different Bob Dole so it had to have been Elizabeth who you know, softened Bob Dole etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, I mean, I'm worried about that well, what's, what's your take on on sort of the evolution of Dole um, because well, he was no doubt about it he was but but well, I mean, he did listen to Elizabeth. I mean, and, and Elizabeth probably did have uh, influence in in terms of where she thought things that might be overly harsh. She might talk with them about them. Uh, you know, I don't know what they talked about. Sure, so, sure. But uh, um, you know, I think most of the evolution was his own growth. Given responsibility. Yeah, given responsibility, and uh, and you know, he had. A lot of years to uh, to reflect on and experiences to uh, reflect on. So I also thought he taught her at least as much oh. as she taught him. Okay. Yeah, but and they have you know I've worked for both of them and they have very different styles and both of them they're very different learners. She is a very non-oral learner. So I can tell him, okay, there are six 
things that you need to know, one, two, three, he'd get it. She wants to see it in writing. And she will read that and she'll have questions and whatever, but that's the way she learns more than all. It's just a difference in style, but uh, it's it, it was, you know, when I first went to work with her, I, you know, you, you'd think that she'd get it quite the way, but, you know, you realize, you know, people are different and yep. she's different. And, uh, uh, I mean, she matches him in terms of uh, uh, work ethic. I mean, they're both workaholics, and I, and I think probably, you know, for fun, he might watch uh, more talk shows or something. I, I guess old movies. Old movies. I think Turner classic movies, yeah. probably. Well, I like those, too, so no, I but, guess... But, it, uh, but did you ever hear, I mean, did he ever talk about sports? Did he ever... Um, occasionally, I think, you know, if, if Kansas were in the NCAA playoffs or whatever, he might talk about that or a little bit of the Redskins. And my guess is he'd watch a little football. Yeah. But, you know, by and large, the the sort of the avid sports, you know, he was a occasional sports fan. Uh, not much, uh, you know, it's not like he's going down to see museums. Right. <laughs> not, I mean, you know, something like golf was physically out of it. You know, it, yeah. it, had he not been injured in the war, he might have taken up something like that because he was such a, yeah. a a great athlete. Um, Tell me about kind of walk through the uh, the uh, an enormous subject in and of itself, and the Social Security and. And, um, that came in '83, yeah. and that that was you know talk about somebody who uh, you know had grown to realize sort of a responsible solution was needed. That commission had been put together, the Greenspan Commission, headed by Alan Greenspan, turned out to be a colossal failure. They basically couldn't find any middle ground. Is no that agreement. because presumably that commission was created because of the inability of Congress to, to do it? And so they, they put this together. Down. And I always laugh when people sort of say, well, we ought to put something like the Greenspan Commission that saves Social Security. The Greenspan Commission was a failure. They, they had written their draft report and they couldn't agree on anything, so they were just going to put out a report with options. And then Moynihan approached Dole and said, you know, we can't leave it this way. We really ought to, we ought to be able to come up with a package that we can enact. And the two of them started talking. And then they brought Stockman in. So Dole, Moynihan, Stockman, and they worked and worked and worked to try to find a package that would be balanced. That every, And then they, they brought more people in it. And that's how that problem was, you know, that, that those 83 amendments were fashioned with the core of Dole and Moynihan and, and uh, eventually Stockman. And, and basically what was the, the, the package? The well, it was, you know, it was a little of this and a little of that to, uh, you know, raising some retirement ages and, and, and it, the, the uh, you know, it wasn't like a uh, bold new direction. It was sort of enough adjustments to uh, put them on a sound footing. And, uh, you know, that's the last significant action in Social Security to today. And we're, you know, people sort of say, oh, we better get together another Greenspan commission. And it's sort of say, you know, you need, you need to exhume Moynihan. But, I mean, my sense was, once again, why Tefra Dole led and legislated responsibly, even historically. But it's hard to see where the political payoff was. No, yeah, I mean, I think he did that because he thought that was what the country needed. And, and, and it wasn't like he was, he could see, you know, hey, if I do this, then uh, my cause is going to be advanced and everybody's going to be cheering for but it. But it's even beyond that. I remember in the 88 campaign, and he would go out and talk about leadership, but that Exhibit A right. was, quote, I saved Social Security. Yeah. And, and the response was invariably, yeah, but, you know, yeah, you did. Four and yeah. 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 taxes and, you know, I mean, ingratitude yeah. raised to the nth degree. And uh, maybe that's, uh, I mean, that's kind of the price of leadership, I think, is sadly probably today. Uh, yeah. As, as no different than then. 
you mentioned oh, and the Moynihan relationship. Was that a relationship that had existed before then? Yeah, yeah. And and uh, Moynihan liked Dolan, I think vice versa. We we uh, of course it was after Social Security, but I, I remember when I was in the leader's office, which was eighty five. Uh, we took a trip to Asia as a trip from hell, but it was a Codell, all Republicans, and Moynihan. Really? So he was the only Democrat that uh, Dole invited on the trip. I mean, you know, had uh, Senator Cohen and Senator Pete Wilson and, uh, and I can't remember who else. Elizabeth was on the trip. Uh, she was traveling as Secretary of uh, Transportation. And she couldn't go to Taiwan with us, but we did like five, five countries in 14 days, and had God, I forget how many meetings. But is it because that's how Dole traveled? Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was. It was. It was. <laughs> he traveled. Broad was like Dole. Dole. In fact, some of the other members sort of think, God, I don't know. If, you know, you have to work too hard on the Dole. Dole. <laughs> I mean, we had. 14 days, we had 40 some meetings, uh, and and from the staff standpoint, we and he gave a major trade speech at the Japan National Press Club, and I remember we had written the, a speech before we left. We rewrote it on the plane, and my whole time in Japan, I don't know quite why I got assigned to do this, but I was assigned to rewrite it, and I probably did three or four or five drafts in in Tokyo and I really never left the hotel corrupted. I just sat there and redrafted until the speech was done and, and I thought, wow, this is great. It's great being in Japan. It's just like being in this room here. Uh, and, and we did briefing papers for every meeting. We did uh, thank you notes for every meeting. And we'd sort of do thank you notes as we go. If we'd leave one country, we'd, we'd we'd have the thank you notes when we arrived in the next, and give them to the embassy and have them shipped back. Uh, except we weren't told in advance where, uh, uh, who, with whom we were going to meet when we went to the People's Republic of China. So we arrived on a on a rainy Sunday. We, I guess, the, the rainy Saturday night, and then we got up early on Sunday, and I went to church the Catholic Church in Beijing and Elizabeth and a few other people went to church. Very interesting experience to go to a church in China. But uh, then we came to the briefing and uh, they were briefing us who we were going to meet with. And, and in the afternoon, everybody was supposed to visit the Forbidden City. And uh, it's a Sunday and the people from the embassy are having to come in on Sunday and they weren't thrilled about that, but uh, they're there. And so we have these meetings uh, coming up in the next week and Dole said, the staff can't go see the Forbidden City. They've got to stay here with the embassy people and work on briefing papers. And so I said, we're forbidden to go to see the Forbidden City, you know. So we were a little bitter about that. Uh, and then I think he felt better. They all went off to see the Forbidden City and we, we, we were there with a very grumpy embassy staff and produced these briefing papers. and. Uh, and then I think he felt bad, and he he told me he said, you know, Elizabeth is going on Thursday to see the freaking city. Why don't you go with her? I thought, no, I'm not going to ever go see this. If I ever go back to Beijing, I'm not going to go see the Forbidden City because uh, I've been forbidden to see it. He but, didn't see Mao either. It is uh, no, um, no. We did see Deng Xiaoping, yeah. which was uh, a very interesting meeting with him. It was in a huge hall, a very sort of strange way to meet because a huge high ceiling, you know, sort of carpeting and, and sort of uh, sort of formal sofas around and, and Dole and uh, Deng Xiaoping were close by. The rest of us were spread out on these sofas all over this thing and they had a microphone system. <laughs> and. Uh, and Deng Xiaoping occasionally would clear his throat and hock a big loogie into a uh, into a spittoon, but he had a microphone there, so it's going. <laughs> <laughs> and when we got done with the meeting, somebody from the embassy that wasn't there uh, uh, sort of said, 
the hell was the meeting? I said, it was pretty good. He said, uh, how many loogies did he hock? Because apparently that, that was what he did. And so, you know, how many, how many times he cleared his throat from the bottom of his lungs? Um, how did Bill handle himself in a, in a setting like that? Uh, you know, he comfortable? yeah, he was comfortable. You know, interested. You know, uh, and and of course drove the. I mean, you know, we'd have evening events. I mean, it was a killer of a trip, with all of these meetings laid on. And uh, you think he was proving something to himself by by maintaining a schedule like that? I don't know. He he left me at the Great Wall of China. Just sort of say, hey, the, these guys, I, I went down to buy a little vest for my daughter at a roadside sand because when we were going out there, all the members were in black Mercedes that took off at 100 miles an hour and the staff and the staff of the place that we were staying with our lunches because we were going to eat the lunch at the Great Wall of China. So there was there were three buses and all these Mercedes and the Mercedes were out of sight and so we're in these three buses and the third bus had the staff and, and bottles of Coca-Cola and, and the lunches and as we're going on a big highway yeah, outside of Beijing going in there a big military truck does a u-turn and and collides head on with the third bus and the bus driver goes right out the window has a compound like the bone of his leg sticking out the people all just cut up and and our bus driver saw it in the rearview mirror and he sort of looked around and we looked around and said my god let's go back and we had chuck peck the uh, the Codell physician with us and Sheila Burke and we pulled those people out of the uh, you know the, got them out of the bus we had to lift some of them out of the window and uh, and put splints on them and and they held down cars because they didn't have an ambulance came to help all these people to the hospital I mean there was a beautiful young girl that was part of the staff she took a hundred stitches in her face because she somehow slammed into a bunch of glass and just got cut up so we were a little delayed when we, when we got there because of this uh, and to some extent covered with blood, but we, we got there, and so we see the Great Wall, and I walk down there, and Dole says, ah, we're not waiting for him. We go out. Fortunately, one of the military people sort of stayed behind with a, uh, a sort of staff car, because otherwise I'd still be at the Great Wall. <laughs> they were moving on. Did he ask about the accident? Yeah, we came and sort of said about an accident. It had a, a bad effect because uh, it was reported back here. You know, Dole Coldale, big accident. No further details. So my wife says, "What?" <laughs> the you mentioned '84, and it's it sounds like every year you every, had to revisit yeah, well, the, the consequences of '84. Yeah, we we had well, I mean, we had big de budget deficits, and and we did an effort to cut the deficit every year, and had a reconciliation bill every year, and so that was part of the pattern: is that you would be doing. A, a reconciliation bill to deal with the deficit every year. Explain to a layman what the reconciliation process is. Well, the reconciliation process is most significant in the Senate in that it is a uh, uh, an override of the normal prerogative of unlimited debate and unlimited amendment. Uh, the, uh, the Budget Act sets up a procedure uh, under which uh, if you're following reconciliation there is a time limit uh, you know a, a specified number of hours which is the maximum time for debate no non-germane amendments are permitted on it uh, and so when you go to the floor with it and and so if, and 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 with no ability to filibuster you can pass something with 51 votes and you don't have to put up with uh, with obnoxious amendments it really has to relate to the bill that you're doing so it it, it was designed official discipline yeah it was designed to uh, facilitate uh, those bills uh, getting done and so we used it nearly every <laughs> sorry every year to uh, Um, the, in, I 
think DEFRA in 84, which was the big tax increase bill in 84, was a reconciliation bill. But when we got out on the floor, the Democrats, who had faced these bills every year, were chafing over the, you know, the inability to offer amendments and the unlimited time. And Dole's on the floor and he said, fine, we'll do this as a regular bill. That's a, quite a gamble because, you know, you could have been tied up forever. But Dole attacked this with his uh, typical determination. He worked people around the clock and said, okay, you know, unlimited, you know, bring on the amendments. And, and, and just by the force of his will, he passed that bill it, without the... the uh, the benefits of reconciliation, which to me was a remarkable tour de force on his part to uh, to get that done. And then, and yet, in '85, you're, you're back again visiting. Yeah, well, we, and, yeah, and 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 he had this this effort to come up with a, a grand spending cut bill, and and that, you know. Uh, I mean, we were going to eliminate totally 18 programs, you know, like the, I don't know, what was Appalachian Regional Commission or, you know, all of these programs that had been around for a long time and, and spending cuts. And it was a uh, quite an ambitious package. And ultimately, uh, uh, we got sold out by the White House and it never happened. Before that, that's the, uh, the Pete Wilson. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah he in the middle of the night and he came and uh, but when we got to the house side the house wouldn't do it and uh, and the White House didn't fully back it and uh, were Kemp and Gingrich involved in the houses. Uh yeah, I think both of them, but Gingrich particularly, and uh, and the other leadership folks, they just weren't excited about spending cuts. But what, do you remember? When you, I mean, do you remember when you found out you were being sold out? I mean, you got yeah. gone. Yeah, we passed it, and then we were meeting with, uh, I think, the White House people. I, I don't know where it was, but we were meeting outside. Maybe it was at the White House. Maybe it was out in the Rose Garden or somewhere. We had an outdoor meeting where this was discussed. And I remember it was a, it was a nice sunny day. I, I just can't remember sort of being sold out in the nice outdoors and the sunny day and sort of being completely disgusted after all of that work. I mean, because you literally, you would all gone out on a whim. Mm -hmm. And basically the White House sold it off. Right. And including in that package, limiting the Social Security COLA. Really? And, you know, people like Paula Hawkins. I mean, he, he may have, you know, it might have been the... Uh, the straw that, that knocked a, a number of our uh, members out because we lost control of the Senate in 86. Now, uh, since I'm speaking for posterity and not now, we had a lot of weak sisters that got elected in 1980. And uh, I remember Senator Dole once said, gee, if I knew we were going to win all these seats, we would have recruited better candidates. <laughs> Well, he had a good point. We, yeah, we had we had a lot of people that uh, that probably really didn't belong in the Senate that got elected by the fluke on, of on the Reagan uh, landslide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so they. Well, I'd say this, when we talked to George Mitchell the other day, um, he he certainly you know commented upon that, but but he still didn't think they were going to win all the close ones. He he was pleasantly surprised that they did what they did. Because, because Reagan's pop, it's pre Iran Contra. Reagan's popularity is still. Yeah, but, and, and yeah, they, but in 1980, it was remarkable that we won all the close ones. I mean, you know, and, and people that probably shouldn't have got elected got elected, and, and then they got swept out in 86, you know. Uh, Remember Larry Bressler? Yeah, well, he was one that survived, uh, you know. <laughs> Explain that. <laughs> Explain why he thought he should run for president. That's, to me, one of the great mysteries. It's sort of, I use that as an illustration for uh, how self-deluded one can become. Yeah. Yeah. That and, and the fact that, that he has done more to 
deprecate the value of the Rhodes Scholarship Program, <laughs> which he was always sort of, God, how does, it, how did that happen? Yeah, but a couple of quick things, and we'll let you go. That because '86, then you had this another this huge tax reform. But the ta that tax reform. I mean, it was, it's not a budget issue. Yeah, it, it did. Home. It was. It was. Re that was really true reform. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, so good. Well, I mean, it really, you know, sort of Bill Bradley. You know, there there seemed to be an appetite for for actually reforming taxes, and the and the uh, you have the sort of Bill Bradley uh, sort of tax justice motive combined with the possibility of significant rate cuts. So you have the sort of the supply siders that like that side of it, and the and the tax reformers that like the base broadening. So the, the sort of the ba basic notion is uh, we're going to uh, eliminate a lot, all of this garbage tax loophole stuff, and the payoff is going to be lower rates. And th there were uh, sort of net increases to uh, business, but for individuals, it was a big tax cut. So you were basically selling simplification. Simplification, and it genuinely was, and 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 justice, you know, and lower rates, and and the the uh, the group that actually got higher taxes was the business side. Now, by this time, Regan had moved. I mean, they, Regan had made yeah. This jobs. The, that that eighty six act was uh, 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 Dick Darman. Uh, Secretary Baker job. At that point, Packwood was uh, was chairman of the Finance Committee and did a fabulous job on the floor. That was a, a brilliant performance on the floor as well. Tell me about the Dole's relationship with Darman. You know, I thought you know Darman is a pretty uh, uh, skilled operator too. I mean, I, you know, I don't know that. Uh, that they were ever particularly close, and then uh, not at all like uh, with Stockman. Hmm. And, and, but Dole and Pack would became very close. And do, and you know, in in part, Packwood was Dole's most enthusiastic supporter for uh, majority leader. Uh, and it was born out of uh, complete self-interest because if Dole became majority leader, then Packwood became chairman of the Finance Committee, which he dearly wanted, and Danforth became chairman of the Commerce Committee, where Packwood was. So there was a, uh, uh, a natural progression that uh, Dole's elevation helped. But, you know, I think Dole, uh, you know, had worked a long time alongside Packwood, and, and uh, and and Packwood genuinely I mean, threw himself into Dole's election as leader. Was he? Was there a campaign manager? There probably was, and I don't know who right. it was. But, and, and but who else? Who else was? Uh, who else was in the field? Ted Stevens. Ted Stevens. Well, it was it was an interesting field. I think there were five people. Let me see if I can remember who they were. Ted Stevens was uh, in the final analysis the uh, the silver medal winner, but McClure had. And it's interesting. I, I went over to Baker's office as we often did, and and drank bourbon with. Uh, the Baker staff and the Domenici was one of the ones running and you know sort of most of the staff of the people running and sort of senior guys uh, Republicans around the hill and we all handicapped the race the same way that the most first round votes would go to McClure who was the head of the steering committee and would have a uh, a hardcore group of uh, of conservatives, and he would probably be number one in the first round. And uh, there's Domenici Stevens. There's somebody that I'm not remembering that was also there. So the first round occurs. First out, McClure who we thought would have the most votes, had the least votes, and, and the only thing I can think of is there were a lot of people that also thought that he'd have the most votes and sort of said, well, gosh, I'll pass him up and, uh, and, and vote for this guy just to keep him in the race. And so uh, 
uh, Domenici was eliminated. The, the other person who I'm not remembering was eliminated and came down between Dole and Stevens, and I think he won by a single vote. Uh, and Stevens, who was not a committee chairman, really wanted this badly uh, and tried to get Dole to, uh, to withdraw before the election. And it's a very difficult thing for anybody outside the, the body to handicap, and much less influence. If you tried to sort of influence senators, so they would be insulted if you weren't. And, and, and these people would call on the other folks and talk with them, but they, you know, they're not natural uh, askers for votes either. And and you know, th those elections are notorious in uh, that some members promise everybody that they're yeah. going to vote for them. That was the was a the famous cactus caucus uh, comment that uh, you all. So what was once to had majority of votes locked up, he goes in the caucus and loses. And he came out and he said, now I know the difference between a caucus and a cactus. He said, with a cactus, the pricks are on the outside. You <laughs> <laughs> Dole was surprised by his victory? I don't know that he was surprised uh, because I think he, th you know, he had talked with all of these guys. I think he was hoping that he had the votes, but uh, you know, you, with a margin that small, you can't really tell. Simpson was a was a, obviously a key supporter. Helms, I think, was a supporter. I mean, th there are people that he seemed to have d d deep affection for, and from time to time I'd ask him, you know, kind of why, and he said that guy was with me when I was, you know, really? like a Helms. And, really, yeah. You know. And now, did Howard Baker would an outgoing leader have any influence? Or? No, and I don't think he tried to influence, it and he didn't have a vote. Uh, I mean, I think he was genuinely even-handed. Yeah. Was, there, was there anything about the Baker style that you think Dole took to heart, or? Uh, yeah, I mean I Baker. Baker was from or, or he, he he was a very genial, uh, uh, even handed decent guy I mean I think Dole probably worked the uh, the body a little harder than than Baker did and probably anybody since <laughs> in, in what sense in terms of just the day the schedule the schedule they, they actually had votes Mondays through Fridays they worked uh, a lot of nights and now you know the Senate had uh, you know particularly before the shift of control I mean they had adopted that sort of a house style they didn't do Mondays and Fridays and they didn't do nights you know I, I would think if you compared the number of hours say in total numbers of hours in session last Congress versus one of the Dole's uh, years it would be remarkably different because he just really worked people hard. Was he surprised to lose the majority in 86? Uh, you know, I think so. I think we were hopeful that we would we would hold on. Uh, but just like uh, the loss of uh, the presidency in, in 88, I mean, he just moved on. But by that time, was he running for president in 88? Yeah. Yeah, so he was, and and uh, he was constantly thinking of of the next moves there. In fact, was there ever, I mean, presumably, as long as you. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the whole time he was thinking of that. Yeah, I mean, not in a uh, way that he would always be commenting on it, but I think that things were, all, the wheels were always turning at some level. Um, when, did, when did you leave him to go to work for her? I didn't go directly. I came back here. Okay. I left uh, in early 86. Yeah. And, and I wore, uh, then when, uh, when, uh, and I went to work for her in 89. Were you involved in the 88 campaign? Yes. 
uh, you know, yeah, I went I went up to New Hampshire. You know, I did everything I could do in that campaign. Uh, What's well, your test about New Hampshire? Because I hate New Hampshire. I'll just just say yeah. that I will never go to New Hampshire to work on another presidential campaign, having done it multiple times with Dole and supported George W. Bush there, all of whom lost. So I've never worked for Is for a campaign that actually won in New Hampshire. Uh, make a sweeping generalization about the voters of the Granite State. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you about the, uh, the number one. The weather up there when in February is is terrible. I ruined my in '88. I ruined my favorite pair of uh, bass weegians up there because it snowed. And I was walking around in the snow on those stupid loafers, and and so when I went up uh, in '96, I had full uh, hunting gear for the for the for the snow. The 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 state is. So overpopulated by uh, politicians and uh, and people working on campaigns and and every two feet is a journalist and and when you go out and put out signs you're putting out signs right next to everybody else's signs it's just such an overload of everything you get a sign to uh, call people on the uh, telephone on a they've already the, number one these are surly people to begin with and after they've been called a hundred times before your call they're super surly and so that really was terrible to have to call people on the phone uh, in contrast going down to South Carolina the weather's nice the cherry trees are out you call people on the phone even if they don't want to talk to you they're polite there's not the overload of things. You can have a, sign, a county assigned to you, and there's not a sign there. It's just virgin territory. You're not having to pound it in right next to somebody else's sign. So, so give me South Carolina. Plus, South Carolina saved all, and it saved George W. Bush. So I like South Carolina, and Granite State never want to go the back. The trajectory of that week coming out of Iowa, well, presumably, I mean, by that, by the time the caucus is, he expected to win. Uh, did, did he expect that Bush would come in third in Iowa? No, I don't think so. But uh, I'll tell you, I wasn't in Iowa. I came up there just after uh, the, the shift, after we won in Iowa. And, and I remember Bob Lighthizer and I, went, when we first got there, we went in to see him, went up to the suite, and uh, the, our pollster was there, Worthland, Worthland. And Worthland said in our presence, he was looking at the numbers and the, the bump from, from Iowa, he said, we're going to win. And Toll said, "Listen to that, guys. He never says anything like that. You know, it was a, it was a very optimistic uh, sort of statement. But he was looking at this, this great surge. And so we thought, you know, we thought we should be measuring the curtains in the White House at that point. Uh, now that's at the end of the week. Now that, and is it, I mean, along about Friday." Uh, after Iowa, because yeah, yeah. So, but then over the weekend, it clearly shifted dramatically. Well, it may have been even earlier in the week than that, but by by you know, I, I, it may have been. I, I don't know when Iowa was. I was on Monday. Yeah, it was. Might have been Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay. Um, well, you know, it, it fell apart on the weekend. Yeah, I mean, the, there was uh, a refusal to sign the tax pledge and. and, and it, why? Was that discussed? Was it? No, I, I think it was sprung on him there. Uh, I mean, he had decided he wasn't going to sign it, but it, it, in the debate, it, I forget where the hell that debate was, but I remember driving up there and that happened and and uh, other things happened and, and of course the polls were, were and, sagging. And we the didn't ads, the ads, the ads, and, and we didn't we didn't, we didn't have anything in the can and we hadn't secured the uh, slots to uh, counterpunch. We had done pretty well at counterpunching up to that point because uh, after spending a day uh, 
uh, calling people on the phone, uh, Lighthizer and I were assigned to follow Bush around. So I went to every Bush speech in New Hampshire. I f we first started, and, and Bob didn't want to go in because he thought people would recognize him from the campaign, and I was a little more anonymous. And I got a pad that looked just like a journalist pad, and so I would go stand with the journalist and, and write notes about what was going on and then call back and sort of say, hey, saying this, I think we can, you know, Bob and I would call, and we'd call uh, Rudman, and, and there was uh, uh, Mike Stevens, uh, there was a press guy. That, that Greg Stevens? Yeah, it was it was a Rudman guy that was working for us, yeah. uh, and and we we would come out with our counter punches, and so we were seemingly doing pretty well for a while, and we got very good at being there uh, rather than following the Secret Service and the entourage. We would call in advance to get the whole schedule, so we didn't have to look like we were some kind of crazy stalkers, which I worried about. Where would you just did, show did up? You sense? Did he sense over the weekend that the ground? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. But I thought we might hold on, and uh, and I was feeling really bad because they were revealing polls, and it looked like we were going down. And, uh, I mean, I went out uh, at a place, uh, got up at. Uh, four o'clock in the morning to go protect the signs at our polling places and then hand out literature at the polling places and of course during that sort of the last you know Thursday and Friday the you know Sununu who had a great political network it turned out his network and so you know you go to the polling place and you know, here's Rod from Virginia, and they have somebody from the Sununu organization that knows by name. Hey, how you doing, Mildred? Hi, Edna. You know, hey, here's the Dole literature. And wasn't it Sununu who personally or was responsible for getting these TV stations over the weekend yeah. opened up to get the, the Bush the, and so, the anti-tax ad? Was it? So I'm at this this polling place in some elementary school in Concord, New Hampshire, and. Uh, who rolls in to uh, hand out literature at that but uh, Ron Kaufman, who was the, the New England coordinator for the Bush campaign, uh, and who ended up, ironically, being the uh, number two guy in presidential personnel in the Bush administration. So the last time he sees me, I'm handing out Dole literature. The next time he sees me, I'm trying to get uh, people cleared at the Department of Labor. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> I've all often thought about the irony of that. Uh, Did you see Dole at all over the weekend? Yeah. Oh, okay. and, and what was uh, his move? I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we were not doing as well. You know, it wasn't the, uh, you know, I think he was clearly concerned and um, so that that was. And then that night, of course, the, the famous. Yeah, show. you know the, that. I sort of watched that on. I, I I went to the victory party, and I lasted about two minutes. And I thought, I'm not staying here, and so I went to a bar somewhere by myself or with a maybe Bob and. Sheila or, you know, sort of a small group of people, and I sort of watched that on television, and then I, I went back and went to bed, because I was, Did you, you know. think the campaign was over? Yeah, yeah, I thought, thought, thought things were, were bad, and it was sort of a, a bitter pill. And uh, I, I just soon, go, then I go into my avoidance mode. And at that point then, you know, we're finished. And uh, my wife had suggested that we needed a new house. And I told her, well, you know, you know, might be going into government. So in August, I bought a nice house in Great Falls where I still live. But more like a lawyer salary than a government official salary to support that. And so in August, I buy that. And, and lo and behold, I end up in, in the Bush administration, the last place I expected to be.